Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we are once again diving into the D&D 1 Expert Playtest rules, but this time rather than looking at the classes, we're going to dive into the rules glossary and the feat changes that came with this packet. This is a pretty large document, so we have broken it into two videos. If you haven't checked out our first video where we go over the expert classes, then you can check that out right up over there. But for this document, we want to focus on some of the feat changes, the rules glossary, and there's a lot of pretty interesting changes here. Keep in mind though that this is playtest material. One D&D is not coming out until 2024, and we have actually seen in this document that from their first document that they released, they have been listening to the feedback because they've already reverted some of the rules that we talked about before that we wanted them to revert. Ability checks don't crit. <laughs> so they are listening. And that actually was really encouraging yeah. to see in this document yeah. because it means that we have the opportunity to give our feedback and Wizards of the Coast is going to listen if enough of us say we don't want that. But yeah. also we should talk about what we do want and what we do love and there is a lot of good stuff in this document, but it is playtest, so keep that in mind. So we're gonna look at the feats, the epic boons, and the rules glossary. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. Let's kick things off by discussing the new feats. And when I say the new feats, I mean they're the old feats, but they're revamped and reconfigured. And there are some interesting changes here. First and foremost, almost all feats are now half feats, yep. which includes a plus one to an ability score. I think that that's awesome because most of the time when I was looking to grab a feat, unless it was something very, very specific, you're looking for a half feat to sure up those ability scores. There were minor changes, at least in wording or effect to almost every feat, everything from athlete to charger, even minor adjustments to ritual caster, which now also gets a plus one. There's also a couple feats that are conspicuously missing ones like magic initiate. But I think the biggest element to discuss here is what's happened with great weapon master and sharpshooter. Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter, if you are unfamiliar with them, we talk about them all the time yeah. on the show, are two of the most powerful feats in the game. Both offer the option for either whether you're wielding a ranged weapon like a bow or a crossbow, or if you're wielding a two-handed weapon, you have the option of taking a minus five penalty to your to hit roll for a plus 10 to your damage. In both cases in this document, that element of those feats has been removed. Now, if you are the same as me, your first reaction is, oh my God, I hate this so much, what have they done? When I took some time to really think about it though, I realized that not, not only do I love those feats and take them every opportunity mm. I get, but I also feel like that is the most metagaming part of me that uh -huh. loves those feats. When I take those feats, when I drive towards picking those feats, it's not because I'm like, ah, my great weapon master, a barbarian, has trained so well with his sword that he hits, he, like, I'm just like, I want plus 10 damage. Give me plus 10 damage. Give me that sweet, sweet damage. And it definitely made the game hard to compare to the characters who could take it in terms of damage dealing. By removing those elements, I actually think at the end of the day, my final statement that I've come to is this is probably a good thing for the overall balance of 5th edition D&D. It probably is. This is one of the places where I mentioned in our last episode, I really want to hear from the designers of the game where their intentions lie with character optimization and damage. What should be, what is their formula for calculating how much damage a damage dealing class should do? What is their balancing metrics that they're looking at here? Because then we could offer more specific feedback on whether or not feats like this are needed or not. Because I'm of two minds here. I worry that without Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master, and with lacking the view of other changes to other classes, what is the damage dealing meta going to be in the next iteration of the game? 
And I really, th this is one of the elements where it makes it really hard to make these assessments without a full slice of all the damage dealing features that are going to be in the game. Because we can't really offer feedback on what the damage should be on these features until we see everything across the board all at once. I also think the other danger that we run into with this, aside from the fact that yay balance is good and those feats were probably too good, but on the flip side, it's well known in D&D 5th edition that spellcasters kind of outperform melee combatants. But not as damage dealers. Fair. Yeah, and I think that that's a big thing that, that is, is missed out on, is that in a lot of cases, the, the damage dealers of 5th edition are the martial classes. They are the barbarians. They are the paladins. They are the fighters. You have to really do some lots of character optimization to make a spellcaster that is as competitive a damage dealer as a great weapon master polearm fi fighter. And I personally don't think that the role... Like, I'm of the mindset that damage dealing should be something that every class can do equally. We shouldn't. We should abandon the notion that damage dealer is a role, and that should be a role that everyone participates in. In that case, maybe bringing these feats down does even the playing field a bit. It it does. It does squish things. Um, but where it does, we we just don't know. Yeah. Because I mean, look at we could get a playtest packet where spiritual weapon requires concentration and fireball does five d six damage. Right, and then then where are we now? Right, yeah. we just don't know where the damage numbers are going to lie yet. So lacking character options around the, these damage dealing things puts us kind of in a in a question mark spot. Again, once again, I believe that really damage dealer as a party role shouldn't exist. Yeah, every class should be able to deal damage and then do another awesome thing. And that puts, puts martial characters in a really odd position design-wise. But that should not be their role, right? They should ha do something else in addition to do doing damage, and spellcasters should too. Ironically, when we look at some of my other favorite feats, Polar Master and Crossbow Expert are still pretty solid. I do think that there's still a play here for being able to have a Great Weapon Master Polar Master mm. because Great Weapon Master still has a really useful property, which is the ability that if you score a crit or reduce a creature to zero hit points, you get an additional attack. Um, I think that that's still a great piece of that feat. And then with Polar Master, regardless of if you are getting that extra attack, you get a smaller, littler attack. Crossbow Expert is still relatively the same, still very useful if you're using crossbows. What I will say about Sharpshooter is they may have gotten rid of the damage, but they've added in the ability that you can now shoot within melee combat. Uh, and they still have that ability that you can forego uh, cover. Now... That actually means that I feel more open to not taking the sharpshooter crossbow expert and having to use the crossbow. I now feel like whether I'm taking the bow or the crossbow and whether I'm taking sharpshooter or crossbow expert, I get to live both fantasies. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that change overall as well. Um, again, I just think that the these feats represent a pretty wide change and we'll see what emerges out of this from the changes. I think it is really hard to judge the changes to the feats without seeing all the changes to all the other classes though. It, it really is hard for me to assess like how this is going to meld because should I assume that the fighter is going to go through unscathed? Should yeah. I assume that the paladin is going to go through unscathed? Um, that's the tricky thing about these things, right? Um, I can tell you that based on this, I think that a dual wielding ranger is going to rock, right? Um, but we'll see. I also do think, again, I agree with everything you're saying, but from my imagination and where I'm going with what's presented here, I do like the idea that dual wielding is now a much more viable option mm -hmm. and seems like it's on par or perhaps nudged even a little higher than holding well, I, a I think it's, weapon. I think the one that, that works really, really well is the, the, the fact that you can do Hunter's Mark with dual wielding and all those other ways to get all the extra damage of dual wielding. Like it actually feels like 
you know, the, between the fighting style and the dual wielder feet and Hunter's Mark and the class features, we see that really clearly because all the elements of that play style are there. Whereas we don't really see, okay, what is a barbarian build going to do? Yeah. Now, overall, feats, some good, some bad, some interesting, a lot to talk about, but we can't go over all of it. And again, really the final statement here is we'll have to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. But as we move on to the next topic, which is epic boons. Epic boons are something that are granted to 20th level characters. All classes in the game, when they reach 20th level, rather than obtaining a feature for their class, get to choose a feat specific for 20th level called Epic Boons from a long list of options. It's in premise, I think that this is an incredible idea. The customization, being able to choose the Epic Boon that you want to bring your character to life at 20th level. Most games don't go this high and so I do think that if you are playing this high, being able to be like, I want this awesome feature is really awesome. Where this starts to fall apart, though, is that when you look at the list of epic boons presented in this document, some make you go, oh, yeah, that would be cool. And others, why on earth at 20th level would I take an option that allows me to misty step once per day? Why, why is that a 20th level feature? I can get Fey touched at level one if I'm a human and yeah. be able to Misty Step once a day without expending a spell slot. Why is this a 20th level feature? I think the epic boons need to feel suitably epic. And I would say as a barometer, I want an epic boon to feel as powerful as getting a very rare or legendary magic item. They should feel like you uh, something transformative something epic something really that powers up your character to meet the final arc of the campaign they should feel aspirational in that respect and yes they, they shouldn't be so much so that you would want to build your character around them because you're not going to get them to level 20 but they should feel like a really meaningful reward and a change that you feel the impact of it I don't feel the impact of re-rolling one die roll once per game. I feel the impact of something that I am able to use in every encounter or multiple times per encounter. And that's what an epic boon should be doing. Yeah, so love the idea here. I hope that they keep going forward with it, but I just want to see yeah. some better epic boons. I also think that there's an argument here that although I love the versatility presented, you could make epic boons class specific. I feel like there are themes that you could tug on, mm. even not class specific, but we saw in this document the breakdown of your experts, your priests. Yeah. You could have expert epic boons, priest epic so, boons. So there's a weird thing here where there's so many things that are weirdly solved by fourth edition that then got missed in the trans lost in translation. Fourth edition did this cool thing with, with its Paragon Paths, which the Paragon Paths basically got turned into the subclasses of fifth edition. That, that's kind of the way that, that that design process got bolted on there. It just happens earlier in the character's career. Fourth edition had this thing called Epic Destinies, which were not necessarily class specific, although some of them were class restricted. One of the Epic Destinies literally was Demigod, and your character was on the path to becoming a god through that epic destiny. And all of them had these really cool, impactful features that oftentimes built on what you got at earlier levels. And so I think that maybe let's just crack open our fourth edition player's handbook and grab some of those epic destinies and use some of the features that were gained there or the feeling of those features in the epic boons. I, I can agree with that. Lastly, we come to the rules glossary section, and there's a lot of small things to talk about here. So we'll just get started and go down the list of all of the changes that stood out to us. There's a lot more than what we're going to talk about, but read the document for yourself. The, this is what stood out to us. Barkskid and Guidance got changed. Bark, like both these guidance. changes. Yeah, both got meaningful improvements that yeah. I think make both more useful. The Guidance change... Similar to the way Bardic Inspiration changed, Guidance was tough to use in the way that it was worded, but now it's a reaction. 
Yeah. I just think the only change that I would make with Guidance is I think it would be totally fine if a creature could benefit from Guidance again after a short rest. I don't think it needs to be as as stringent as that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I Once again, we mentioned this off the top, but the reversal of the automatic success on an automatic failure on ability checks appears to be gone. Yeah. So that means thank you, Wizards of the Coast, for listening. Mm-hmm. We appreciate it, and good job. Uh, another big change here that I really enjoy and that has been discussed on the show and talked about within the community a lot is uh, equipping and stowing weapons. Yeah, so you can now just equip or unequip an item before or after taking the attack action. I like this change. I think that it just smooths things out. Like, I don't really like having to worry about the action economy around what I'm holding in my hands. It's it's one of those weird nitpicky things, and I just like the idea that whatever you're doing with your action, you can get what you need to do that action with. Um, there's still a little bit of this in, in that I think the dual wielder feat still lets you draw or stow two weapons, and I, I just wish that would just die. Like, just just let us grab, like, change whatever you're holding once per turn. Like, yeah. <laughs> now, when we come to uh, an example of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but they tried to fix it, is the exhaustion rules. I don't really think I had any issue with the exhaustion rules. I did. I thought that the exhaustion levels got very punishing very quickly so i think that a lot of player characters once you got one or two levels of exhaustion you're like i'm tapping out i'm done whereas now you'll getting one or two levels of exhaustion sucks because it's a minus two penalty but it's not it doesn't suck so much that you're going to stop adventuring for the day see maybe maybe this will actually have a better impact because my also my my other issue with exhaustion is that aside from stupid barbarians who (laughs) pile on their own exhaustion levels at our tables um there is also the fact that i rarely see exhaustion come up because one or two exhaustion levels are so strong yeah yeah and now maybe it's more free to use them yeah, I, I I do. It's still one of those weird places where, hey, this is the only place in 5th edition so far where there's an actual penalty to your d20 rolls, which makes it a weird outlier that, that it's a numerical penalty as opposed to advantage and disadvantage. So that's the only thing that makes it stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of sticking out like a sore thumb, I have a few issues, not overall, but just with the way that they've presented the special movements. Hmm. This is another section that there's actually quite a bit here, and I think that the wording could have been clearer because it took me a little while to figure out what was going on. The idea here is now that if you have a walk speed, which we all all characters do, but then if you also have a climb speed, swim speed, or fly speed, you now have to, on your turn, choose which movement type you are going to use. I believe, and again, this would be helpful to have their intention behind this, I believe the intention is that it was complicated when you had a 30-foot movement and a 40-foot fly speed. There was some weird math involved that you could move 15 feet and then fly. A, like The trip up was that there actually wasn't weird math involved, right? Was that if you had a fly speed of 60 feet and a, and a swim speed of 30 feet, that you could swim 30 feet but then still fly 30 feet? Like yeah. all the movement modes counted against the maximum? But now it's different. Now it's different. Now you choose your movement and you move for that type of movement for your turn. At first, I was like, well, climb speed. What if I want to run the five feet up to a wall and then climb it? And at first, I thought you couldn't do that until you actually read the section on climb speed that says you can use your climb speed on a horizontal surface. Yeah. So I guess you get down on all fours and skitter across the ground and then up a wall. (laughs) No, I'm not going to describe it like that. But they included that text and I went, oh, good. And then I read the swim speed, which didn't include that text, which means that if I'm standing five feet away from a pool and have a swim speed, I can move the five feet, jump into the pool, and have to swim with the penalties that would be associated with it until I either use the dash action or I wait till my next turn to actually use my swim speed. If we're going to include the text in the climb speed, I think that we should include it in the swim speed as well. 
Fly speed doesn't matter because you're just flying. I, I'd actually say that with the way the rules are worded right now, we could simply say that climbing and swimming count as difficult ground and that there is a climber trait that lets you ignore it and a swimmer trait that lets you ignore it and just let fly speed be the separate thing. Because it, it feels okay if a fly speed is, is a separate thing because that's often going to be a variance. But at least as far as player characters are concerned, all the class features that we saw for rangers and rogues, you gain a climb speed equal to your walking speed anyways. So having just to be a climber trait that difficult that climbing doesn't cost you extra movement, swimming doesn't cost you extra movement, and then it would be fine if the special movement speed really was just flying and probably burrowing. And those are both speeds where it probably feels okay that you shouldn't combine those. But I think that swimming and climbing are often combined with a regular movement mode. And so we need the rules to support that. One other thing that I thought was really interesting was the codification of influence, search, and study. This seems to be trying to take elements of the game that were a little bit too open-ended and add some mechanical rules to them. How do you think they did? I think that it's great that these exist here, but I think that more work is needed with all of them. I so I think with the study action, this is, again, another thing that many in the community have pointed out used to exist in 4th edition. And this is where 4th edition actually had, for its monster entries in many of its monster books, what happened if you made a knowledge check regarding the monster you were looking at and gave Dungeon Masters DCs and results of what the player characters learned? And I personally think that the study action baked into that table should actually be like, this result allows you to learn if the monster has resistances or immunities. This result allows you to learn about one of the monster's attacks or something like that. That would be really cool and that would actually make the study action worth doing in combat so that you can actually learn what your monster or what your foe does. The big one that I love, but also again, it's a step forward but a step back for me, is the influence action. The really cool thing about both, for me, study and influence, uh, study does give some clarification for me on using the intelligence-based skills, which mm -hmm. a lot of people have a hard time using at the table. So having a mechanical background there to, to kind of promote when to use it is really great. It needs some finessing. And with influence, I think we're in a similar boat. That This is presenting a situation where you can actually read the mood and tones of the monsters that you're engaging with. It gives this really cool social aspect that you can use in different parts of the game, allowing, again, I think all of these take skills that were tough to use at the table and gives them purpose. Whenever I see this years ago, this was a long time ago, but the creator of Order of the Stick, Rich Burlew, for third edition, did a really nice set of house rules for persuasion and dis diplomacy that were based around the idea of who the attitude of the NPC and what you were proposing. Mm -hmm. And he had put out this whole way of like, here's how, based on what the players offer to the NPC, the DC is affected. And that's the biggest thing that I think that this section is missing, is it needs to say what the players are proposing and the attitude of the monster and the monster or the NPC itself are all going to influence this. We cannot have it be a DC 10 and be a DC 20 for it's the same DC 10 to influence a friendly human shopkeeper as it is to influence an archangel or a deity, even one that is friendly to you, the DCs for those things should not be the same. And I, I do think that most DMs know about setting DCs. This isn't like yeah. a confusing or problematic part of the game. As a DM, the first thing you know is whether you want to pick a 5, 10, 15. Usually I go in fives. Yeah. Occasionally I pick 18 or 12 or, you know. But I have my numbers that I always go with yeah. and I base it on the situation happening at the table. To tell a new DM that... If they roll a 10 or higher, this happens. It sounds like you're giving them something concrete and that's beneficial. And I understand that maybe that was the intent. Like, here's some concrete yeah. rules to use. Yeah. Great. But I actually think that it takes away the nuance of social situations in the game. And sometimes an, a, a character is going to need an 18 to even be convinced to do something for you. Even if they're like, I like you. And you're like, can you go on this quest and help us? No. 
th- there's a really easy way to adjust this and and again I, I have to give credit to Rich Burlew for for presenting this is that and we can adapt it to fifth edition and the the mode of, of saying okay if you are making an appeal to a non-player character that touches on their ideals flaws or bonds in a positive way the DC is lower and if you're making an appeal to that NPC in a way that goes against those things the DC is higher and then you use that alongside the monster attitude and it, it doesn't it just is a very firm formula that works I've been using this in all my games as a way of whenever I'm trying to decide what the DC for a social interaction check like a, a persuasion check should be I ask what's the attitude and is this appealing or unappealing and so it's really only two sort of metrics and then you kind of get your finesse range right but it shouldn't be firm fixed numbers that are solely based on the attitude what the characters are proposing should be a factor in this this whole thing this is also a weird thing i want to say that this is degrees of success here because uh, getting a 10 on your check result then um is a better result than getting a is not as good as getting a 20 on your result and now this is a really weird in, interaction with bardic inspiration because you can only use bardic inspiration on a failed check so if you get a 10 on your persuasion check you succeeded at that level so can you still use bardic inspiration to try to turn the 10 into a 20 so if we're going to use degrees of success we have to watch out for how we're using failed check results as well i love degrees of success i think that D 5e should use that idea of there's multiple outcomes to a check result i think that for anyone that's played any apocalypse world system once you get used to the idea of the de- degrees of success existing in your role-playing game you want it yes. because it matters you see all the times where it can matter how well a character succeeded or how badly a character failed and i want that in it's easy to implement in 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 fifth edition it's just five or more five or less and all of a sudden you have like really bad failure failure success really good success and that makes it for it's very i mean apocalypse world only has three uh, there's just the middle range right yeah, yeah there's the middle range where what you do works there's the lower range where it doesn't work and there's the high range where it works plus a benefit right S- whatever it's better than nothing it's better than it just being binary <laughs> yeah whether you go three four or five whatever as long as we have more than just success failure now one thing that they did include in the text here that i was very relieved by is when i started reading this section i was like wait any player character can just roll a DC 10 check to make a hostile creature not attack them. That seems ridiculous, but it does say yeah. in here that the DM has the say to be like, this hostile creature hates you so much that it doesn't care if you're trying to talk it down. Um, I imagine that when it does come into play is when like, you know, you're doing the Chris Pratt and the Raptor thing. The Raptor <laughs> is probably a hostile creature, but you are making your check to be like, you're not gonna eat me right now. Uh, fair, I get yeah. that. That's cool, um, but yeah, I think those DCs should be fluid. Yeah, and I do think ultimately, like having more guidelines for dungeon masters that help them determine what the DC for an ability check should be is never a bad thing. Yes, we can find that the rules get bogged down by explaining here's all the corner cases and here's all the weird DCs. But I liked that. Like I found that fifth edition was a little bit too light in saying here's how to pick your dc well whatever you know just pull a number out of your butt and that'll be fine and oftentimes you ended up defaulting to either 10 15 or 20 yep right but even numenera and the cipher system which is a d20 based system it it has actually i think numenera probably has the coolest chart for this at the monty cook cipher system where it goes up in increments of three and it really clearly explains what the different check results from a DC zero to a DC 30 actually mean. And that for me, like you can actually just completely use that yourself as a dungeon master in any D20 based system. And you're like, oh, Monty Cook figured it out. But of course Monty Cook did because he made third edition D D. Yeah. Right. So he's using that from third edition, which is the granddaddy of all this stuff, at least of the modern iterations. I think that 
overall, again, we're nitpicking and talking about things that we would like to change even further. But yeah. at the same time, I think that overall, I actually love a lot of this document. I think that this the, that, that attitude reflects two things. It's overall a conservative set of changes. It's tweaks, it's iterations. And I think that we're just kind of finessing how this edition's going to change. We're not getting that massive revision to D&D that maybe some people were expecting. What I do think we are getting, though, is a Wizards of the Coast that is listening to the community because so many changes that are hidden away in this document that got me the most excited were things that I have heard being mumbled and talked and whispered yeah. about on the internet, on forums, in our own community, on our own channel, everywhere uh, for years. So to see those changes being implemented, yeah, there's a few new things that they're trying out that I'm like, eh, you don't really need to change that. But there's a lot of good that I yeah. that I've just I'm excited. I wish I was using the 1 D&D &D rules for my rogue because I just hit level 13 and I want that level 13 ability. I mean, we could try them out, um, but I, I feel like what the weird thing about this is like we've talked about streaming a couple games where we play test D&D &D 1, and I feel like if you streamed it, you with the flow of how a, our, a stream game goes, we would forget things. <laughs> Yeah. Because I think that's the actually the hardest part about playtesting this is that so many of the changes are so close and are so similar that it's really easy to forget where the changes actually are. That's going to be the challenge yeah. for me is when this does come out, I'm going to have been DMing 5th edition for years yep. and I have everything up here that it's going to take a while to, uh, as, as Yoda said, I must unlearn what I have learned. Yeah. Whereas if you're playing a completely different system, like, you know, you're you're being more careful. But, like, I could see literally playing a playtest of D&D &D 1 and going for an entire encounter without actually realizing what version of the rules we're playing with. Yeah. All in all, I would love to hear what everybody else out there thinks of the changes happening here. What did you love about this document? And what do you think could use some extra yeah. tweaking? Tell us about your thoughts on this playtest document in the comments below. And as before, please keep the comments constructive and friendly. Um, of course, with any edition change, there can always be lots and lots of feelings around how things are changing, how things are iterating. But we just want to just give that friendly push to be nice in the comments, be constructive, so that we can all contribute to the evolution of this game that we all enjoy playing. Yes. So this has been a look at the one d d Expert Classes document released for playtesting recently by Wizards of the Coast. Again, let us know what you're thinking in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible because we have an amazing Patreon community that helps support our work. If you enjoy what we create here on YouTube, please consider becoming a patron of our show by following the links in the description below. And if you want to see us playing D&D, you can check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which is Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've built a new playlist to compile all of our discussions on the D&D 1 playtests right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.